Good afternoon, everybody. Happy Tuesday. Um, I do not have anything off the top. Sean, do you want to kick us off? Uh, sure. Could I just uh, start with, with uh, American citizens and permanent residents and others who are leaving Gaza? <laughs> I know there's a new figure that's that's been given of 400 mm -hmm. um, who are out. Can you just explain a little bit more about that? Uh, the time frame, are there still coming out? Have there been people coming out today? And how many, presumably there are some, how many are still left as far as you know? Thanks, Sean. So yes, we have assisted more than 400 US citizens, uh, lawful permanent residents and other individuals uh, to be able to depart Gaza. Uh, we continue to work in partnership with the government of Egypt and Israel towards safe passage for more U.S. citizens, their immediate family members, and U.S. Uh, lawful permanent residents. And we encourage those whose names may have appeared on previous lists uh, that have been published by the Palestinian General Authority for crossings and borders uh, to make their way to the border um, and attempt to, uh, tra uh, to, to exit. It's our understanding that individuals whose names had been on previous lists published um, can present themselves and uh, should be able to cross. Uh, this, of course, is a very fluid and quickly evolving situation. Uh, there are three entities uh, involved in controlling access to the border crossing, Israel, Egypt, and Hamas, and uh, we're continuing to work uh, with Egypt and Israel uh, to ensure that American citizens who have indicated a desire to depart uh, are able to do so. As you've seen over the past um, number of days, uh, the American citizens have been able to, to, to exit, uh, and we expect this number to, to continue to grow. Sure. If, if I could just pursue it, uh, you said that sure. more um, safe passage for more uh, afterwards. Uh, the Secretary, I believe it is a week ago on the Hill, gave a figure of 1,000, including citizens, green card holders, relatives. Doing the math, is it safe to say 600 are still waiting, or is that, or, or the figures have they been evolving? I mean, that is, uh, if you were to do basic arithmetic, that is, of course, the the, the number that you would uh, you you would get to. But I, I again just want to what caveat as we have in any circumstance that involves American citizens in any part of the world, uh, we of course do not ask uh, American citizens to, to register when they travel and, and so on and so forth. Um, so I just want I'm I'm, I'm hesitant to uh, provide a, a pinpoint metric, as of course this uh, is an ongoing and fluid. Situation. Situation. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I have more, but if people want to pursue anything. So. Um, do you have um, an update on the aid trucks that have been able to go through Rafa? Uh, I do have an update on uh, uh, additional uh, humanitarian. Uh, so as of November 7th today, uh, approximately 526 trucks carrying humanitarian supplies have entered Gaza through uh, the Rafa crossing um, as reported uh, by the UNOCHA. Okay, and then if I could ask about some comments that Netanyahu sure. made yesterday about um, who should govern Gaza when fighting is over. He said uh, he thinks Israel, for an indefinite period, will have overall security responsibility. What's your take on those comments? Have you sought any clarification from the Israeli government about what they meant by that? Um, do you have any concerns? So we, uh, of course, engage with our partners in the Israeli government uh, uh, on about a numerous uh, a number of things, especially currently uh, as the situation continues to be ongoing. I would uh, refer you to the prime minister's office for further elaboration on that particular quote. Uh, our viewpoint is that uh, Palestinians must be at the forefront uh, of these decisions, and Gaza is Palestinian land, and it will remain Palestinian land. And generally speaking, uh, we do not support uh, reoccupation of Gaza, and uh, neither does Israel. Secretary Blinken was fairly clear about that uh, during his travels as well. Uh, but uh, it's important to note that at the same time, we agree with Israel that there is no returning to the October 6th status quo. Uh, Israel uh, and the region must be secure, and Gaza uh, should and can no longer be a base from which to launch terror attacks against the people of Israel or anyone else. And so we're working with partners uh, on various scenarios, on interim governance, on security parameters, on security situations uh, in Gaza for once this crisis recedes, but I'm not gonna get ahead of that process. Uh, we'll get into it from here. Have you been in touch with his office since his comments came out? As I said, we are engaging with our partners in Israel uh, around the clock on a number of issues. I'm just not gonna get into the specifics of uh, uh, the day-to-day the -day diplomacy. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, can I follow up on the aid trucks, please? Sure. Because <clears throat> last week, the number of aid trucks getting into Gaza 
seem to be increasing every day. Uh, and since the crossing closed for a time over the weekend, it seems like there's been a significant curtailment both in people coming out and aid going in. The administration has voiced its frustration with the amount of aid going in as being insufficient. So can you provide us any insight into what the slowdown of the delivery of aid is attributable to? Well, on the first, to, to take a step back on the issue of, of basic math, the number that I'm providing today is an increase from the uh, number that I provided yesterday that was reflective of the total since November 6th. Uh, broadly, though, there are a number of issues at play here, uh, 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 primarily being uh, this is not uh, a crossing that uh, uh, the United States controls. We are engaged directly in diplomacy with our partners in Israel, with our partners in Egypt, to ensure that um, aid can flow. We are working uh, appropriately with um, uh, uh, the Israelis to develop uh, inspection mechanisms that would allow trucks to move into Gaza quickly uh, while still uh, undergoing full inspection. Uh, the secretary raised this during his visit. This is an area that also has been rattled with blackouts and other other um, uh, instances that have made both the entrance of aid and for the voluntary departure uh, of, of civilians um, to somehow, to at some instances, be uh, slower than uh, not just the United States, but anybody would uh, want in this circumstance. Uh, but that is exactly why Special Envoy Satterfield is in the region, uh, engaging in a diplomacy, working with the Israelis and the Egyptians on this to ensure that humanitarian aid can get into Gaza. Uh, and so, uh, simultaneously, we are working around the clock on the consular piece of this so that American citizens and uh, their family members and legal permanent residents who uh, choose to depart are able to do so in an appropriate manner. Uh, of course, no one is trying to indicate that the, the rate and the clip at which these have been happening have been satisfactory. We think more aid needs to be get, getting in. We've been very clear about that. We think American citizens who uh, are interested in departing need to be able to do so swiftly, and we're working around the clock to ensure that. Yeah. Is 100 trucks a day still the goal? Uh, I'm not going to put a specific metric on it. Our, our goal at this point is doing everything we can to ensure that uh, RAFA opens at appropriate intervals to allow uh, for the influx of humanitarian aid into Gaza, as well as for the safe departure of uh, American citizens, LPRs, and eligible family members. If, if I may, one question sure. on, on hostages. Yeah. Uh, so U.S. officials have said that the hostage releases that we've seen to date were sort of pilot cases to see if the pause for release system could work. Are we to take from the fact that no additional hostages since the, that initial release have been uh, made to, uh, as an indication that that system doesn't work and won't pave the way for the release of additional hostages? I, I'm not going to get into the uh, specifics of diplomacy beyond saying that uh, the release of hostages has, of course, been a key and evergreen goal of ours since October 7th. The Secretary has been incredibly clear about that, not just with his Israeli counterparts, but also any country in the region who may have a relationship with Hamas or who may have influence over Hamas, and, and has been sending a very clear message that all these hostages uh, need to be released. It's exactly why this administration has been clear-eyed about its call for uh, a humanitarian pause so conditions can be created that could potentially lead to additional hostage releases. That could potentially lead to an influx of additional humanitarian aid as well. So this is something that we're continuing to pursue. And just quickly, is there an update on the hostage negotiations that have I, been ongoing? I, I don't have any uh, any updates. Okay. To I have one more on the reaction within this building. If you'd like to go around. Yeah, why don't I, I? I can come back to you. That's great, uh, Jaleel. Go ahead. Thank you very much, Mr. Patel. Uh, this next question I want to dedicate is it, it to on the region or is it uh, off different. topic? No, okay, no, I will come back to you okay, then. Good. Michelle, go yeah, ahead. Uh, are you aware first uh, of uh, an assassination attempt uh, on President Mahmoud Abbas and uh, the West Bank? Uh, thanks for your question, Michelle. So I saw those uh, public reports as uh, soon as uh, right before I, I came out here. So I unfortunately don't have any specifics to offer on that. Uh, I'm saying this solely on public reporting. Uh, we are continuing to pay attention. And as uh, we have more information um, from the United States' perspective, we will certainly uh, share that. Um, from the public reporting, it seems that uh, uh, President Abbas himself was not uh, harmed. Uh, but again, as we get more information and as the situation develops and we have anything additional to share, we'll, we'll make sure to share it. And my second question is on uh, 
the attacks on the U.S. forces in Syria and uh, Iraq. There have now been uh, 40 attacks uh, in this region uh, since October 17th. Uh, President Biden, Vice President Harris, Secretary Blinken, and other officials threatened Iran and its proxies not to do it. They have done it. What's next? So, uh, Michelle, I don't think you need to look any further than uh, how we have tackled the threat that has been Iran um, over the course of this uh, uh, entire administration. We have used a combination of deterrence, pressure, uh, and diplomacy to counter Iran's destabilizing activities. Uh, I will also note that we sent a very loud and direct deterrence message uh, to Iran about our our willingness to, to 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 vigorously protect our personnel and our interests. Uh, late last month, on October 26, the U.S. military carried out strikes against two facilities in eastern Syria used by the R IRGC and affiliated groups. These precision self. Um, defense strikes were a response to a series of ongoing and largely unsuccessful attacks against U.S. personnel in Iraq and Syria, as you said. So we've been very clear that, one, we will take any steps uh, possible to uh, protect our, our, our personnel and our, our interests in the region. But additionally, um, we have been very clear to countries in the region that we are incredibly keen on ensuring that this conflict does not spread. And in the matter of Iraq, uh, that's something that we raised uh, directly with uh, Prime Minister Sudani on Secretary Blinken's trip. And uh, the Prime Minister has also called these attacks unacceptable uh, and has committed to to, uh, taking pos whatever possible steps they can uh, to stop these attacks. On the uh, same topic. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Thank you, Bilal. Uh, yesterday, the Islamic resistance in Iraq, they attacked Erbil Airport, and some civilian flights were canceled because of these attacks, because these attacks, it's true that they are saying that we are targeting the U.S. bases in the region, but they are endangering the, the, the people in the region, the civilian people, the, the civilian airport, especially in Erbil, the Christian region of Iraq. And today, the president of the Kurdistan region said that this is extremely dangerous development in the region, and we call to some solution and to hold those groups responsible. What engagements do you have with the Iraqi and with the Kurdish government to prevent these attacks to not put dangers to the civilians and the people who are living in the region? Well, I'm glad you raised that. Uh, the impact on civilians, uh, of course, um, uh, in this context, but especially uh, in these attacks that are being carried out in uh, uh, in, in Iraq is, uh, of course, of, of, of importance to us. And one of the uh, aspects that we have raised directly with the government of Iraq, it's something that the Secretary uh, raised directly with Prime Minister Sudani. Uh, I'm not going to get into the specifics, but we, uh, the Prime Minister himself, called these attacks unacceptable, and it's something that we're going to continue to engage on with the Iraqi government uh, to take whatever steps we can to hold uh, the perpetrators accountable. And one, one more question. Sure. And where are you in, the, in your discussion with the Israeli government on the humanitarian course? And could you give us speak? about this humanitarian post, what do you mean by that? I mean, on, on the what? Humanitarian post. Humanitarian yeah. post. Um, again, and I touched a, a little bit about this yesterday, uh, our uh, goal, uh, our end goal here, I think, is threefold. Is first, uh, we want conditions created that uh, will allow for the entrance of additional humanitarian aid into Gaza. Uh, we want the conditions uh, to be such that will allow uh, potentially for additional hostages to be released uh, by Hamas. Uh, and we also want the conditions to be such that Hamas is not able to use uh, such a time to regroup grow stronger, position itself in a way to further attack the people of Israel uh, to conduct further terrorist attacks. So we can call it whatever uh, we want, uh, but that is what we are looking at, and those are the end goals that we are trying to achieve through uh, our diplomacy, through these engagements that we're having, not just with our Israeli counterparts, uh, but with partner countries in the region as well. Rabia, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, there are uh, some alarming reports coming out of Gaza with regards to uh, shortage of uh, uh, fuel, fuel, fuel shortages. Many hospitals announced they won't be operational. 
uh, without new fuel supplies. Do you have any updates on the uh, U.S. efforts on getting uh, fuel inside Gaza? Yesterday you said the U.S. continues to work on this, but do you have any updates since yesterday? I, I don't have any uh, specific updates for you. Uh, again, we recognize uh, that fuel is urgently needed uh, in Gaza and the uh, critical role that it plays uh, in both the access to free water, clean water treatment, desalination, and things like that. Uh, we also uh, understand the critical role that it can play uh, in uh, ensuring some basic needs and protecting public health, and that's exactly why uh, uh, Special Envoy Satterfield is discussing ways with uh, Israeli authorities, with Egyptian authorities, donors, uh, and aid agencies on what mechanisms exist to uh, enhance the flow of fuel uh, into Gaza to benefit the civilians but I don't have any updates for you. Go ahead. Do you have any um, information on Israel Tur specifically turning away trucks that have tried to enter uh, uh, upon Israel's inspection, including because they were carrying fuel or any other reasons? I don't have any specifics reports to share, but what I can just say on the um, inspection mechanism, and I touched a little bit on this, is that that's something that we're working uh, diligently with our Israeli partners on. It's something that the Secretary raised uh, during his travels as well. We're working with them to develop uh, additional inspection mechanisms that we hope will allow trucks and aid to enter Gaza more quickly and more efficiently, and uh, we're hoping we'll be be able to talk more about that in the coming days and weeks. Um, Alex, go ahead. Hi, Sam. Uh, very quickly on the Secretary's trip, I want to get you out of middle East briefly. I know you will be loaded back anyway. It, it, um, I think there's on, quite a few other questions on the on the yeah, on the on the region, Alex. Trip, so if yes, this uh, is not on the region. I'm going to have to come back to you. Uh, yeah, just yeah. very quickly on the trip, then come back to me on uh, Ukraine and Russia. Okay. The Secretary, when he met with Turkish officials, uh, did he get any assurance uh, that Sweden will become NATO member by the end of this month? That's the, exactly the kind of question. That's not uh, not, okay. not on the region, Alex. Um, uh, uh, I'm just, I, will, I will take it because you just asked. Um, look, uh, we uh, have been very clear about uh, our, our viewpoint on um, uh, Sweden's accession uh, to NATO. We have long felt that they are uh, ready to be uh, a, a NATO ally, and we think that uh, the 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 agreements that were made under the uh, the, the Madrid summit um, have been met. Um, and so we're going to continue to work and let this process play out. I have no doubt that it, it was something that was discussed, but I'm not going to uh, get beyond the the, the, the readout. Let's have a clear understanding of why, why it is taking longer. Like, uh, any, again, I'm just not going to get into the, the, the specifics beyond that. Sam, you your hand up patiently. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, the uh, group Democracy for the Arab World Now, founded by slain journalist uh, Khashoggi, put out a recent statement um, charging that there's a grotesque hoax by the Biden administration, not just green lighting, but bankrolling, ethnic cleansing. Um, they specifically cite parts of the supplemental that the administration has sought that fund uh, the proposed uh, humanitarian aid to Palestinians who have been displaced from Gaza into neighboring countries. And they also highlight the fact that the Israeli government appears imminently planning uh, a permanent the move of per Palestinians permanently from Gaza to Egypt, and they cite uh, a leaked Israeli intelligence ministry report uh, along those lines. So, what do you have on that? I, um, I, I realized that earlier in your comments, you seemed to distance yourself from this notion. You said that it was Palestinian land uh, and that you were opposed to this, or that was the implication of your remarks. However, there, there it is. You're, you're asking for the money to do it. So let me just be, be clear about uh, a, a, a couple things here, Sam. First, we continue to provide support to Palestinian refugees through the UN, through UNRWA, uh, and the U.S. is going to also continue to support efforts for safe passage for civilians in Gaza seeking safety. <sighs> Uh, as it relates to our foreign policy, the U.S. does not support any forced relocation of Palestinians outside of Gaza. It is not a policy we're pursuing. It is not something that uh, is, is on the table. So why are you asking for funding for it? I don't, I, I don't understand you, your this, question. This group, Democracy for the Arab World Now, founded by Khashoggi, says that you're asking for funding for new Palestinians, not just displaced from 48, not just displaced from 67, but displaced from this, 
the conflict from, from Gaza into Egypt and other neighboring countries. I think it's an open secret so that Israel has been attempting. So we are not engaging in any situation in which Egyptian land would be leased. I've not seen that letter, uh, nor am I going to uh, get into the specifics of the uh, funding request to Congress from up here. But uh, forced relocation is not uh, is, is not something that we are I, looking I could, at or is I, on the table or a policy that we support. I'm, 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 I'm asking you about your funding. You. Uh, Excuse me, but not thank you. How long of a pause in the ceasefire does the State Department and President Biden uh, have in mind for Israel in a brief follow-up? We're not calling for a ceasefire. ceasefire. Okay. That's not policy we're pursuing. Okay, then follow. Uh, why aren't the Secretary of State Blinken and President Biden asking Hamas and Hezbollah for a pause, for a pause in their firing of rockets on Israeli communities? I. You know, the reasons, don't even know uh, where to, for, where to begin with that talk. Uh, we have, since the onset of this conflict, we have uh, condemned uh, Hamas uh, for their destructive uh, uh, terrorist attacks on the Israeli people on October 7th. We have also been incredibly clear to Hezbollah and any other uh, malign uh, actors uh, that they should not use this opportunity to widen this conflict. And when we're talking about a humanitarian pause, uh, uh, what we are talking about is uh, conditions that simultaneously ensure that Hamas is not in a position uh, in which it can regroup, re-strengthen itself, position itself in a way to further conduct uh, attacks on the Israeli people, while also creating conditions that uh, perhaps will allow for the further provision of humanitarian aid into Gaza that will perhaps allow uh, conditions that other hostages can be released as well. well Go ahead. Is still I, I've taken, I've taken two of your questions. To, Go ahead. Thank you. Just to follow up yeah. on uh, Sam, in March 2021, Secretary Blinken accused China of the crime of genocide for its alleged treatment of the Uyghur minority, but he didn't accuse them of killing on any mass scale or force, forcible transfer. Now we see with Israel's military assault on Gaza, something like one out of two, every 200 people in the Gaza Strip has been eliminated. Over 4,000 children killed, the Ministry of Intelligence, as Sam pointed out, in Israel has published a blueprint for the forced transfer of the entire Palestinian population to Egypt. We have the intent to commit genocide expressed at the highest level of the Israeli government, including Netanyahu himself referring to the Palestinian population as Amalek, the biblical Amalek. So I wonder, you know, when, you, when you're accusing one country of genocide without accusing them of mass killing, and then blocking ceasefires to enable another country's military assault. What metric are you using to determine genocide, or is this just political rhetoric? It's certainly not political rhetoric. Uh, the department, and I talked a little bit about this yesterday, we have a rigorous process uh, in place for evaluating whether something constitutes as genocide or not. And that is true in any country that uh, that situation might be being looked at. Uh, that is not a term that we have assessed pertains to this current conflict. We are, of course, monitoring the evolving situation and are examining facts as they develop. Uh, this continues to be um, uh, an incredibly uh, challenging uh, and, and fraught situation, but it's also important to remember that Hamas bears responsibility for sparking this war. Uh, they have brought this tragic war uh, to Gaza. Okay, well, President Biden has accused the Russian government of genocide for its actions in Ukraine, where in two years, it has killed as many civilians as Israel has killed in one month in the Gaza Strip. So how do you account for that disparity where you're assisting one country and accusing the other of genocide when one the country you're assisting has systematically killed so many more people in one month? Those circumstances are totally and completely uh, not the same. And to make a comparison like that, candidly, is um, incredibly uh, uh, inappropriate. We have been, please don't, please don't interrupt me. We have been, uh, we uh, have raised directly with uh, the Israeli government about the need to uh, distinguish between Hamas terrorists and uh, Palestinian civilians. Uh, this is something that the secretary has raised directly on his travels. He, uh, we even laid out that we believe that there are um, 
commitments that can be made additionally on dealing with protecting civilian life more effectively. Uh, and we're watching very closely to, to, to make sure that happens. But you've referred to Palestinian civilians as human shields. Doesn't that blur the distinction but between civilians and militants? I, I am not, we have not referred to Palestinian civilians as human shields. We have said, we have said, we have said, we have said that Hamas is using Palestinian civilians as human shields. That Wouldn't is that not be... that is not hyperbole. That is something that we have seen Hamas do as they continue to uh, integrate themselves into key civilian infrastructure across Gaza. Wouldn't that be blurring the distinction between civilians and combatants if you say Hamas is using civilians as human shields? Wouldn't that be in some ways justifying the killing of civilians because they happen to be we, in the we way are not in justifying, their homes. We are There is no one in this administration that is justifying um, killing of civilians. Any civilian life loss uh, is incredibly troubling, heartbreaking to us. Any number above zero is deeply troubling to us. What we are doing is we are working with our Israeli partners to ensure that steps can be taken to minimize the impact on civilian life. And we also have uh, believe that there is a moral imperative, there is a strategic imperative to take steps to minimize uh, loss of civilian life. I'm gonna work through, I've answered like four of your questions. Yeah, you, you could, one, sorry, yeah. on your answer yeah. to the genocide question. You said you're monitoring the evolving situation and examining the facts as they develop. Um, is, are you confirming that the U.S. is examining Israeli bombardment of Gaza to see if its actions constitute? No, that's not. I, I, I did not say that to indicate that there is some active uh, ongoing process. This is uh, par for the course as we observe conditions and circumstances around the world. So there's no active Correct. process looking at this specifically? Cor correct. Okay. Given, uh, given, just to follow on that yeah. briefly, given the circumstances, is one likely? Uh, I'm just not going to get into internal deliberative processes that exist at state. I want to. Is it could I go to Sean and then I can come back to you sure, before no, you said yeah? Uh, it's, it's 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 related somewhat. Okay. But, um, another aspect of this: uh -huh. um, the the killings of journalists uh -huh. in the conflict. Um, there's a, a committee to protect journalists report, I believe, out yesterday, which is saying that uh, 37 journalists have been killed. Uh, the vast majority of the Palestinians in this conflict. I think another one today. The Secretary General of the United Nations said that this is the deadliest conflict for, for journalists in, in quite some time. To what extent is this? Is there a concern about about the the, the killing of journalists in terms of ways to avoid this, uh, and, and in terms of you know why why this is actually happening? I would say, of course, Sean, that the impact uh, of this conflict on journalists and our concern of uh, journalists being uh, among that could potentially uh, be targeted when it comes to civilian casualties, that, of course, continues uh, to be uh, tantamount and something that we are paying attention to and have uh, raised with uh, actors in the region uh, about this as well. It's been raised actively. In terms of it's when we talk about when we talk about uh, uh, ensuring that civilians are not placed in harm's way. Of course, journalists are, are part of that, and we continue to believe that um, uh, civilians, including journalists, uh, that steps need to be taken to ensure that they are not impacted uh, uh, within this conflict, that they are not targeted or killed um, in this conflict. And just finally, I mean, is there any concern that there has been a deliberate targeting of some of the journalists? Uh, I'm not aware, nor have I seen any. Uh, uh, reporting to, to, to indicate as such. Go ahead. Um, about this building, mm -hmm. I just wanted to ask you because there have been multiple reports about the response and maybe in some cases the outcry uh, within this building about the U.S. policy um, approach to this conflict. So first, can you say whether you are aware of the formal submission of one or more dissent channel cables uh, by American diplomats? And then secondly, if you could speak more broadly to how leadership here is responding um, to those with deep expertise in this building uh, who believe that America's foreign policy here may be ill-conceived. Ill so uh, first, I, I'm just not going to speak to the specifics of the dissent channel out of respect to the integrity of the channel. What I will just say is that this is something that has been available to employees since the Vietnam War, and we are proud that the department has uh, an established procedure for employees to articulate uh, policy disagreements directly uh, to uh, senior department principals uh, in this building without 
fear of retribution. Um, I will also say just broadly that we understand and we expect uh, people in our workforce to have different personal be beliefs, uh, different beliefs about what U.S. foreign policy uh, should be. Uh, and in fact, we think that that is one of the strengths uh, of, of this government. Um, and it's one of the strengths of this department in, in our ability to engage with people who have different opinions. Uh, and we encourage uh, individuals to continue to make those uh, opinions known. Um, it's also important to remember that uh, the president is uh, who sets uh, this policy, and we all up here at least um, serve uh, at his pleasure. Uh, but we encourage everyone, even when they disagree with our policy, to make uh, their leadership know uh, the dissent channel is one of those mechanisms. Um, I will also note that we continue to uh, take uh, the responsibility to our workforce uh, incredibly seriously uh, and recognize that this is an incredibly taxing and trying time. This conflict is incredibly fraught. Uh, we have, uh, like any workforce, ensured that the workforce knows what mental health resources are available to them in this trying time. And I will also just add that throughout this deliberative process as it relates to UN for U.S. foreign policy, we have uh, engaged directly, the Secretary has, with uh, those who may have dissenting uh, opinions or different opinions from what uh, current U.S. foreign policy is. That's democracy. That's part of the process. Just very quickly, because apart from the articulation of opinion or grievance as it may be, are, are there people with expertise in policy whose views have been incorporated uh, as as the situation has unfolded? I, I'm, just not gonna, I, I'm just not going to read out the specifics of what a deliberative process or what the interagency process is like. Uh, there are, of course, the ways that decisions are made in any administration uh, involve the inputs of a lot of people across a lot of different agencies with a lot of differing equities. Ultimately, though, it is the president who sets uh, the policy. But simultaneously, we have a number of mechanisms uh, at our disposal available to the workforce for them to share uh, their dissenting viewpoints, whether it be the dissent channel cable, whether it be discussing directly with department leadership, which there have been opportunities to do so as well. Uh, Alex, go ahead. I'll come back to you. I have a question, non Middle East related, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, Ukraine, I'm sure you have seen multiple uh, reports uh, over the weekend that the U.S. is uh, pushing uh, Russia, uh, Ukraine is a dialogue with Russia. Uh, there have been spe speculations here, a bit of around it. So I want to give you a chance to clear the clear up the air. Have sure. you guys done anything? Like, so any negotiations, Alex, are up to Ukraine. And as we have said uh, a number of times before, uh, nothing should happen uh, about Ukraine without Ukraine. Uh, we are not aware of any conversations with Ukraine about negotiations outside of the peace formula structure that you've already seen a number of um, engagements take place on. Uh, but it continues to be incredibly clear, Alex, that uh, the Kremlin has no interest in negotiating or ending this war. And we are committed to supporting our Ukrainian partners. Moving to South Caucasus, if you sure. uh, Yesterday, Matt put out a tweet about uh, what was going on in Georgia. You know, a Georgian uh, uh, citizen was uh, killed by yeah. a Russian, I don't want to use occupied terrorists. Um, my question is uh, you know, the country has been you know, ruled by a, a party that you know, has been promoting Russian propaganda for a long time. Uh, are you uh, in a position to step in and defend Georgia? should Georgia you know, uh, become a target for Russia? Uh, uh, Alex, I, I, I'm not going to get ahead of uh, uh, anything that happens that would be incredibly inappropriate, but I will just echo what was in the tweet yesterday, which is that we condemn uh, that killing. Uh, and it is another uh, example of the destruction that is ongoing, that's being caused by Russia's occupation of uh, Georgia's sovereign territory uh, and elsewhere. And it's something that we'll continue to monitor and, and call out as well. Thank you. My final question, uh, Armin Azerbaijan, yeah. we were told in September in this building by senior officials that both Azerbaijan and Armenia had agreed to you know, send their officials to Washington for another round of meeting. Now, we, are, we have seen lately they are engaging in carousel of you know, form shopping. 
Is Washington still an option for uh, for, for for next round of the of, of course. Uh, look, Alex. Outside of everything that, of course, is uh, going on in the world that um, uh, often sometimes takes up a lot of the oxygen in this room. Uh, peace between those two countries continues to be a priority uh, for us, for Secretary Blinken, and it's something that uh, the department will continue to uh, engage towards. Go, you had your hand up. Then I'll come back to you, John. Go ahead. Thank you. So two questions regarding China and South sure. Korea, if you don't mind. South Korea is the key U.S. security ally, and the State Department has been very clear in raising concerns over China's human rights practices as well as its economic coercion toward other countries. So the State Department has also in three different human rights and, and religious freedom reports highlighted a particular issue in which the Chinese embassy in South Korea has been using its economic leverage to pressure theaters in South Korea to try to block performances by an American company, Shingun Performing Arts. So it's an American arts company whose classical Chinese dance shows have been banned in China because they include pieces portraying human rights persecution in China. So my question is, does it remain a concern by the State Department that in such incidents like this, China is using its economic pressure to influence the freedom of expression in an ally country? Broadly, I would say it, of course, continues to remain of concern. Uh, the PRC has a very clear track record of using um, economic coercion and otherwise in a, uh, in, a, in a wide array of countries, not just necessarily uh, the ROK. But uh, this is, of course, something that we're going to continue to address in close partnership with uh, the ROK, with Japan, with other countries um, uh, in the Indo-Pacific as well. Follow up sure. um, regarding Secretary Blinken's trip um, yeah. later this week. So, in addition to, of course, talking about countering threats from North Korea, does Secretary Blinken also plan to address countering China's regional influence in his meeting with South Korean counterparts? Of course, like you said, meeting with other Indo Pacific partners as well. Uh, you've heard me say this before, or I will say uh, those in this room have heard, heard me say this before. Um, any aspect of our foreign policy, uh, whether it be the Secretary's current uh, uh, presence at the G7 or his soon-to-be uh, presence um, in India with Secretary Austin. Uh, it is about our foreign policy and the foreign policy of those countries. And in the G7 case, the foreign policy of those uh, member countries. It is not about anything uh, other else. What we have long said, of course, is that we do not um, ask countries to choose between the United States and the PRC or any other country. It is about offering them a choice and continuing to show what a deepening partnership with the uh, United States uh, can look like. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, two questions from Georgia. Yeah. Do you have any update about the long-term um, observation mission to Georgia from the U.S. for 2024 uh, parliamentary elections. That's going to be the first time that we're going to have the long-term mission. Any updates on that? Uh, I'm not uh, aware of any specific updates. Obviously, though, in any uh, circumstances around any election, we would want to uh, ensure that they are held uh, freely and fairly and, of course, uh, when applicable in accordance with uh, uh, OSCE uh, parameters. But I'm happy to check if we have anything more specific. Thank you. And the second question, for a month, the ruling party of Georgia and the government members of the Georgian government claimed that the U.S. is providing funds for coup uh, preparation through USAID. What is your reaction and more generally, how do you perceive these type of claims coming from a government that receives millions of dollars annually from the U.S.? I think I spoke about this an, a number of months ago. And uh, again, again, the again, the answer is this is uh, absolutely not true uh, in any country around the world. Again, the U.S. does not favor anyone political party or the other, or one particular government outcome or the other. Uh, again, our goal in any of these circumstances, any of these contexts, is ensuring that uh, there is freedom and fair elections held in uh, accordance with the appropriate standards. Sean, you've got your hand raised. Sure. Can I just a few around the world? Try to be succinct. Sure. Um, do you have any readout of the meeting? I know I asked yesterday about the, the climate meeting and setting lines between. I, I don't. Period. I don't have a specific readout. I'm happy to check with the special uh, envoys to team to see if we have any specifics to share. But I will use this opportunity to again echo as two of the world's largest emitters. Climate is a, a unique um, area in which the United States and the PRC have uh, an opportunity in which their, um, uh, I, I won't say partnership, but their uh, ability to work together can reap benefits uh, for the entire world. And so that's uh, a, an area that we've long said uh, is an area where we can continue to engage with the PRC on. Sure. Uh, let me just switch topics, mm -hmm. although 
also really to China, uh, Burma, Myanmar. If you have any comment on the fighting that's in the north, uh, the Kachin uh, rebels, uh, China said that one of its na- some of its nationals have been wounded in this. Does the U.S. have any statement about anything to say about about the nature of the conflict and whether there's their concerns about? I, I don't at this moment, Trump, but I'm happy to happy to check and take back. And finally, can I go back to Ukraine? Do you yeah. have anything to say about um, President Zelensky saying it's not the right time for elections? Obviously, it's it's already. Because of the war, there's the martial yeah. loss. So, yeah. But but what do you do? You have any comment about his intentions? I think it's important to remember that Ukraine is in this position because uh, Russia continues to wage its full scale illegal war against Ukraine. Uh, Ukrainians people are fighting for survival. Uh, it's also important to remember in the context when we talk about elections that uh, nearly 20% of Ukraine's territory is occupied and tens of millions of its citizens are displaced because of Russia's war, many of them outside of the country as refugees. Uh, on top of that, Russia continues to launch daily bombardments of civilian infrastructure across Ukraine. Uh, We also have made clear with uh, uh, our Ukrainian partners our commitment to supporting not just Ukraine in its fight, but our commitment to uh, support a careful and constitutional approach to keeping uh, democracy strong uh, in wartime. Sure. But in terms of the actual decision not to go ahead with it in early 2024, is that from your viewpoint, the way you describe it, it's, it's understandable. Do you have any? My understanding is that is this is consistent with their uh, their constitution. So uh, uh, we'll just leave it to, to the Ukrainians to uh, share anything further on that. Go ahead. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Pakistan uh, deporting hundreds of thousands of Afghan refugees, uh, including those who are waiting for their American visas. According to U.S. Embassy Islamabad, they tried to stop the deportation of 25,000 Afghan workers, but Pakistan rejected that list. Like to say something about that. So we join partners in urging all states, including Pakistan, to uphold their respective obligations in their treatment of refugees and asylum seekers and to respect the principle of non-refoulement. We strongly encourage Afghanistan's neighbors, including, including Pakistan, to allow entry for Afghans seeking international protection and to coordinate uh, with the appropriate international humanitarian organizations. So we have seen rise in violence and terrorist attacks in Pakistan. Yeah. Um, uh, some of them claimed by TTP, some of them claimed by the newly formed group Tariqe Jihad Pakistan. And uh, in a recent attack uh, at Pakistani air base, uh, Pakistani security forces claimed that they recovered American-made weapons from TTP terrorists uh, left by U.S. in Afghanistan. What kind of CT counterterrorism cooperation is going on with Pakistan? What, what are we going to say about these American-made weapons recovered from the terrorists? We are aware of the reports of multiple attacks on Pakistani security forces and facilities uh, uh, earlier uh, in November, and we offer our condolences to the families of the victims. But uh, I want to be very clear about this. There was no equipment left behind uh, by American forces during the withdrawal uh, from Afghanistan. Uh, I will also add that uh, uh, while large-scale military grant assistance remains suspended, we have partnered with Pakistan for more than 40 years to support law enforcement, rule of law, uh, counter-narcotics efforts, and other areas in the security space, and we'll continue to value our bilateral relationship. Jaleel, if you want to close us out. Thank you very much, Mr. Patel. Uh, This question I want to dedicate it to a fellow journalist, a Pashtun journalist who started an English newspaper from Peshawar, 40 years ago when the university didn't even have a journalism department, Mr. Rahmat Shafridi. Uh, the Pashtuns uh, who both in Pakistan and Afghanistan are about 50 million people since Cold War, then the Taliban rule, then 911. It is one ethnicity that has suffered the most, whether it's their culture, language, uh, you know, moving within the country. State Department takes many initiative studies, whether it's reports and can the secretary be kind enough to study how to, to study how the Pashtuns' ethnicity has suffered since the last 40 years as part of their culture and everything? Well, Jalil, uh, I think it's important to, to remember here that in any context, as we talk about um, Afghanistan, the people of Afghanistan, uh, that we have been very clear that our uh, commitment to the people of Afghanistan uh, is enduring. The United States continues to be uh, the single largest humanitarian donor to the people of Afghanistan. Uh, and of course, within that, um, uh, there uh, is, of course, the, the, the Pashtun people, that subgroup. Um, but again, it's important uh, to, to keep that in mind. 
Daphne, did you have your hand just, up? Just one more question. Right, I'll come to you. Former Prime Minister, a known corrupt politician as well, Nawaz Sharif has come back to Pakistan. He has been convicted by Supreme Court, a big staunch opponent of Imran Khan. So does the State Department welcome uh, Mr. Nawaz Sharif's back to Pakistan politics? Anything to say about uh, that? As I said um, just earlier, in, in, any, in any country, we um, are not supportive of one particular party or government uh, over the other. Uh, and in the context of, of any election, it just uh, continues to be paramount that elections are held uh, uh, in a free and fair manner uh, and reflect the will of the uh, people residing um, in that country. Daphne, go ahead. Um, thank, thank you very you. much. Sorry, just quickly no, on Gaza. Yeah. Uh, this meeting in Paris on Thursday to coordinate aid yeah. for Gaza, Gaza, who from the U.S. will attend? So I don't have a full uh, a delegation list, but I can share that that uh, delegation will be led and headed by uh, Undersecretary Azra Zaya from the State Department. And the possible creation of a maritime corridor is expected to come up, which is an idea that's been put forward by <laughs> Cyprus. Uh, did Blinken discuss this in his meeting with the president of Cyprus and and uh, is this an idea that the U.S. supports? So uh, what I will just say on uh, the uh, delivery of AIDS and the various methods, uh, the U.S. particularly, we use a, a number of, of, of methods, including trucks and overland routes, as well as airplanes and helicopters. Uh, uh, I will let uh, this convening discuss uh, what uh, options that might exist for uh, a, a maritime uh, corridor as one of those channels, uh, but I'm just not going to uh, get ahead of that process. We certainly have broadly felt that uh, the provision of aid and any country's ability to do so to the, the Palestinian people in Gaza uh, uh, would be a good thing. But, all right. Thanks, everybody. How are you able to say anything about the Amish of Spain? Is it through Lebanon? What I can uh, close out with, uh, Michelle, is that uh, the senior advisor to the president, Amos Hochstein, is in Lebanon today to meet with members of the Lebanese government to demonstrate uh, the U.S.'s continued support for the Lebanese people. In his meetings, uh, Mr. Hochstein will continue to emphasize the U.S. is not interested in seeing this conflict uh, spread to Lebanon. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.